Hello, my name is Charlene Garcia Sims and I'm the genealogy and special collectors librarian here at, here at Rawlings Library. I want to welcome you to the seventh annual Latino Book Festival and I want to thank Maria Smyer for coordinating all of this and, and all your hard work and for inviting me to interview Mario Acevedo. Today we have a very special guest and author from Denver, as I said, Mario Acevedo. Mario Acevedo is the author of the national best-selling Felix Gomez Detective Vampire series. Most recently, Steampunk Banditos, Sex Slaves of Shark Island, and the young adult humor thriller, University of Doom. His debut novel, The Nymphos of Rocky Flats, was chosen by Barnes & Noble as one of the best paranormal fantasy novels of the decade. His speculative fiction has appeared in numerous anthologies to include A Fistful of Dinosaurs, Straight Out of Deadwood, Blood Business, Nightmares Unhinged, Cyberworld, and You Don't Have a Clue. For 2020, he has short fiction in the forthcoming horror anthology, Psy Wars, and it came from the Multiplex in a Western novel, Luther, Wyoming. His work has won an International Latino Book Award and a Colorado Book Award. Prior to becoming a professional writer, Mario was an airborne ranger, an infantry and aviation officer, an attack helicopter pilot, and a soldier artist in Operation Desert Storm. In civilian life, he has worked as an engineer and taught art in prison. He also served as a president for Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers and the Rocky Mountain Chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. Currently, he serves on the faculty of the Regis University Mile High MFA program and Lighthouse Writers Workshops. Mario lives and writes in Denver, Colorado. Mario was with us for the first festival uh, with Denver author Manuel Ramos, and then the second festival with New Mexico, New Mexico author Denise Chavez. We had a lot of fun, and I'm delighted to have you uh, back in Pueblo, Mario. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor that you invited me again. Uh, obviously, I didn't do anything wrong those other two times, so, yeah. so here no, I am. You, you didn't. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be asking Mario some questions, and uh, please pay attention because uh, we're going to be testing you at the end of the program, and there will be prizes. So um, I was asked to interview you about the books and your career as an author. So let's get started. Your first books are about a creature in the night. What inspired you to create the Felix Gomez character? And tell us about Felix. Okay, what inspired me to write about Felix Gomez was uh, desperation. Uh, <clears throat> what happened was uh, I, I when I started writing, I thought I'd be writing uh, at first literary novels and then I kind of uh, uh, sort of morphed into writing um, men's action thrillers because that's what I like to read. And I, I had probably written uh, seven, <clears throat> excuse me, about seven uh, manuscripts, you know, unpublished, six actually. And um, I had one that I was sure going to get me published. I mean, I was, and, and it didn't get anywhere. <laughs> and I was so frustrated that I said, well, the hell with it. I'm going to write the most ridiculous story I can think about which is a vampire detective, a Chicano, investigates an outbreak of lymphomania at, at Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. And, you know, and the thing is, I really didn't like vampire novels and that I just decided to write this crazy story. And that's the one that got published, I guess, because it was just so crazy. Um, and the, the reason I wrote about him is that uh, I, uh, I just came to mind one day, this idea of this vampire detective investigating nymphomania at Rocky Flats. It's just such a weird thing. And those, that's the way I think anyway. So, and it came in, so I started fleshing them out. Um, so that, that's, that's why it was inspired me. Um, Felix Gomez, you know, um, I wanted to, I had never read about a, a Chicano vampire before. So I go, why not? And, um, you know, and I thought in, you know, in literature and in mass media, we have, you know, Latinos were always usually criminals, right? or low lives, or just maids and service workers. And every once in a while, they're lawyers, right, on the, on the TV and stuff, or crooked politicians. So I thought, well, I'll make this guy the anti-hero of a story. Why not, right? I guess it's about time we needed a, a Chicano vampire. OK, thank you. Um, I think the first, um, not Chicano, but La La Latino vampire, I remember, is uh, Banderas, and, uh, and uh, I can't remember which, which movie it was. And so when I, I picture Felix Gomez, I picture him really good looking. 
So he, he, he pictures himself good looking too. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, oh, we read a little bit earlier that you were a Desert Storm infantry officer and helicopter pilot. Did this influence you uh, to make Felix Gomez an, uh, a war veteran? Uh, I, I would have to say yes. Uh, simply because if you, if we read the the first chapter, the Nymphos of Rocky Flats, that's actually based on something that happened. I didn't see it, but I was with this unit, and it was near the end of the desert desert storm, and everybody was really excited because we, you know, the war went very well for our, our side, and something very very bad happened, and these soldiers, somebody made a mistake, and it really weighed heavily on people, and. I, I remember listening to it, and and then the aftermath was going on, and I and I processed that, and even even though that was before it got published, I said I'm going to file this in my head. It was such a powerful story, so so that's that's why it started with with that. I mean, I needed I needed something different to explain how Felix became uh, a vampire. Uh, I I incorporated some mythology from the Middle East in, into that. So he's got that, and then of course now that he is a veteran, I mean that that part of his personality resonates through the story uh, because that's part of uh, what he is or what he was. So there's that part of it. Um, you know, he's, he I was an officer; he was a sergeant. So as we used to say, he used to, he used to work for a living <laughs> uh, as a sergeant. Uh, so you know, he's got a little bit different sensibilities uh, than, than than I have. Um, yeah, so I just definitely wanted to flesh them out, use some a little bit of experience, but at, if, if there are other experiences, is mainly from my observations in civilian life that I pull into his character rather than from the military. Okay, thank you. And uh, you started him off in in Los Angeles, and this is where I thought you were from, and now you tell me you're from what you know Las Cruces. But anyway, why did you move him as a PI from Los Angeles to Denver? Okay. Um, I know I never really gave a lot of thought to his backstory uh, other than the military aspect of it in the first book. Um, and in the first book, I, I, I don't I don't think I remember mentioning much about where he was from and all that. And he just was went to Denver to work. But actually, he in, in the second book, because I had to delve more into who he was and give him his backstory. I, I explain it in the first book that he's actually I never say Las Cruces. I, I just say he's from southern New Mexico. And there were issues with his parents and his father was an alcoholic and that he would he would bounce around from southern New Mexico to Pacuima, California, which is outside of Los Angeles. And so he he references that he's back and forth, bounces back, back and forth between the two. Uh, so Felix actually identifies more as being from southern New Mexico than being from uh, Los Angeles, even though he has strong ties on Los Angeles because he would live with his aunt. In Pacuima, and big surprise, I had an aunt in Pacuima. <laughs> so that 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 let me put a lot of uh, touchstones in the story. Uh, and then it was just the reason he went to came to Denver is because he he had this old college friend that had worked for him to do at Rocky Flats, and that's that's why he, that's how he ended up in Denver. Okay, um, thank you. And I'm going to prove to you that I read that book. Okay. Uh, when I lived in Denver, I too, like Felix Gomez, ran into raccoons. What do you recommend a person do when the sun has still not risen and one of these creatures jumps out at you from under your car? When a raccoon jumps out at you? Uh, well, hopefully you don't let him bite you. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, I remember that scene. He got, he was escaping and he ended up going in that culvert and he got into a slap fight with a raccoon, which is very undignified for a, a vampire to do. But he had no choice because that vampire, because that raccoon was not yielding his ground. So, so here Felix, his badass vampire, is getting into a slap fight with the raccoon. So I would not recommend going into culverts that have raccoons in them. So raccoons are not very nice. I they are that. not very nice. Everybody thinks they're really cuddly and cute, but they are really mean. They are not. Um, EOS is an imprint of HarperCollins, which is pretty impressive, and that's who published your, your first book. What steps did you take to sell them your first book? Because they're, they're pretty big. Oh, yeah, EOS, HarperCollins. Actually, my first book was bought by uh, Rio, which was an uh, imprint of HarperCollins. And Rene Alegria was the, the publisher, was the head of the, the Rio house. And uh, the, the idea was uh, for, for Rio, which either means underline or line or uh, lightning, depending on 
you know, how you want to uh, 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 translate that. Their plan was that was supposed to be their HarperCollins's venue for uh, Latino or Spanish speaking, English speaking writers. And what they would do is that they would get uh, work from overseas, usually from Spain or, or South America, and and translate it into English into this into the U.S. market. And then at the same time, the, the idea was to get um, Latino writers from the U.S. and translate their work into the market. Unfortunately, it, it didn't it didn't quite work out because it turns out that, for example, here in the U.S., I don't know what it is, but like a, a Latino writer and a Latinos love science fiction. But when they get science fiction, look for science fiction, they identify themselves as readers of science fiction, not readers uh, of Latino work. At the same time, people who who saw themselves as you know readers of Latino literature wouldn't go to science fiction, and it wasn't just me. There were some other people like Linda Sandoval who wrote some romance uh, kind of chiclet stories, and you know she had some of the same issue. So in the year two two thousand eight, when they had the big financial crisis, and that hit Harper Collins, and Harper Collins axed uh, Rio. And um, they they push they didn't push me over but they they slid me over to EOS because that's that's where my uh, audience is uh, in in the science fiction market. So so, you, uh, so go ahead. Did you send your manuscript in or how how did did you make contact with them? Okay, with well, okay, well, uh, the way I got I got picked up by Harper Collins was um, I had. I had been to this route before. I'd finished the manuscript, and now it was going to be the issue of querying and and getting query letters and rejection letters. And and I had been to that route many times before. So I I had gone to the uh, Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers. They had a program on um, uh, query letters, and it was written actually by an, a literary agent. So I sat in, and it was very instructful, very insightful. Um, and he talked about the process of query letters and, and how they're written and all that. And um, he he mentioned that he was representing a zombie novel. And I thought, well, zombies, <laughs> zombies are nothing compared to vampires. So I actually followed him out of that uh, out of that seminar into an elevator, and I actually gave him an elevator pitch in an elevator. And I told him that, you know, this. I had a uh, written a, uh, a book. I had a, a Latino vampire detective investigates an outbreak of nymphomania at the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant, and I pitched it exactly that way. And he looked at me and he goes, "Oh, that's different." So he gave me his card and he goes, "We'll keep in touch," and we did. And that was in uh, November, I think, of two thousand three. And then, in, and then in uh, January two thousand four, he decided to represent me. And then I think somewhere around how oh, maybe it was like August or September of 2004, uh, he, he gave me a call and said that uh, Harper Collins had decided to uh, make an offer on the book. So, you know, it took, it took a long time. It took a while. So that's not how it happens. I, I, you have to get a prime. Usually you have to get a liter literary agent. And then the literary agent will represent your book and they have to query the different publishers and they have a working relationship with the publishers. So they understand what the publishers are looking for. A publisher might say, you know, I'm really looking for this kind of a book. And hopefully the agent will say, ha, hold that thought. I just happen to have a, somebody who's writing a book like this. So, you so know, it's a very, yeah. yeah, sort of answers like my next question, you know, how important is it to get an, a literary agent? So, well, entries, yes. Well, yeah, you got. Yeah, I would. I would definitely recommend that because the the alternative would be, uh, for for the larger publishing houses, the alternative would be what they call sending something in unsolicited, which means it goes into the slush pile. And um, what what they do at the publishing houses, they have they get this big slush pile of manuscripts, and generally speaking, they they actually try to give you a fair shake. In, in the fact that there might be something in that slush pile, and it's happened before. So what they do is that they usually get like the interns and the and the assistant editors one day, and they have like a pizza party on a Friday afternoon, and they go through the unsolicited manuscripts, and they listen until somebody says stop, and then they go okay, and then they push that aside. 
But every once in a while, they'll be reading a manuscript and everybody's like, go on, go on, go on. And they'll say, okay, this one we'll pay attention to. But you're talking about like one out of 100 or one out of 200. I mean, it's a very small amount. Uh, getting a, an agent, it's, you know, a lot of it is a matter of timing. Um, a lot of it is a little bit of matter of luck. But at the same time, you know, you have a... If you're serious about this, you have to write the best book that you can. Uh, you have to be aware of what people are, are, you know, what your audience is going to be. Um, and then you have to be aware of what your agent is looking for, because some agents are looking for specific kinds of work. And if you send them something they're not interested in, you know, you're just kind of wasting your time. So, you know, it is it is a it is a long shot, but, you know, it's something that you have to do. And the, the issue of getting rejection every big every writer's gotten rejected at one time so you're just going to have to to go through it now the question is okay where are you going to find an agent if you live in this area well there are several places um like lighthouse has their lit fest and in that lit fest um which is in june what they do is that they invite agents and editors in and then they have what they call pitch sessions where you go and you talk to an agent and editor and, you know, they listen to what you have to say. And if they like what you say, they would invite you to send in your manuscript. And that way they, they, it moves you further up the pile. Um, uh, that's at Lighthouse. Uh, Regis does something similar to that in their MFA program. Um, the different writing conventions uh, have agents and editors there. And that's an opportunity for you to meet them sometimes on an informal basis, but it's an opportunity for you to meet them. Um, you know, I just go on, uh, uh, just, you can just Google, look for a literary agent and you get stuff that comes up. The one thing that I would invite uh, that I would, um, uh, recommend to any, everybody is, um, do your homework on a, on a literary agent, because there are some people out there that are not ethical. If an agent asks you for money, like what they call a reading fee. No, that, that that's a, that's a no go. Do not go with that agent. Um, the agent should also tell you who they've represented in the past, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a give and take. It's a big, you know, and people tend to be a little bit intimidated when they talk to agents because they think, well, this agent represents all kinds of big people and stuff. And the act, and the act, and, and in truth is that you're the writer, you're the one providing the content, you're providing the material that they need to sell. So you, you just need to position yourself to best be able to do that. Uh, but it's a tough business, okay? I'm going to tell you, it's it's not easy. I know, and I'm really glad that you're mentioning the Lighthouse uh, in Denver. I love the concept. Do they have a website? Yes, lighthousewriters.org. Yeah, I would recommend that people look at it because I just love, love love its concept. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. Well, and you know, let me, before we leave that, I think uh, I'll put this on you is to maybe contact Lighthouse and uh, invite them to come to your to your library and talk to people about what they do or have some kind of a mini thing going on. I don't know, I'm, you know, but uh, that would be a good way to expose them to you because they're, they're trying to grow. They've actually grown a little bit more into Boulder and actually into the Southern, uh, like the Highlands, Castle Rock area of Denver, uh, trying to, you know, reach more writers. And I think that would I be- will try to, I will try to get a hold of them because we've had, you know, writers workshops and everything. I think that would be excellent to, to come here. So we'll, we'll pl uh, plan on that. So my next question is, has anyone offered you a movie deal again? No. <laughs> I wish. I mean, every every writer wishes that, and you never know. You know, it's, it's, it's not even worthwhile expending any energy on it because uh, it happens when it happens. Uh, I've had two friends, uh, well, one one good friend, and, and somebody else that I kind of, another writer, and they actually had movie deals made, and it really didn't do much for them at all. Um, you know, you'd think uh, because the movies didn't do well. Um, and I mean, so that that in itself is something separate. But then there are other people who when a book was made out of their uh, movie was made out of their book, it just, I mean, exploded. It's like Chuck Palahniuk for Fight Club. Fight Club was sort of this pretty much unknown book until they made a movie out of it. And then now, he, you know, he became uh, very well known and and, you know, good for him. You know, he got all this. Uh, attention and financial resources and, and you know that that he was wasn't getting he was a technical writer and this book uh just happened to make a big splash because of the movie so you know that that's 
that's always good. I also know a lot of writers who do what they call tie-ins, which is they write. If you go to the bookstore, you see movies like about Star Wars or um, Dune is another one, um, Star Trek, and you'll see those with the movie tie-in books. So I know the writers who write those as well. Okay, thank you. And maybe we can get um, either Antonio Banderas or somebody like Antonio Banderas to, to play Felix at some point. And I do know a real good script writer if you're, if you're interested. Um, well, let's go on to... Uh, uh, the YA uh, portion of your career. I'm very excited. I'm reading the University of Doom, and I'm, I'm just like I'm like like on page 100. So I really want to get back to it tonight. And uh, and this is for young adults. Why uh, did you go from adult literature to young adult, and uh, how different is it to switch? Here's the book. Um, well, it wasn't so much that that I was looking for a young adult. It was just that the story was in my head. Um, and I was, as I was thinking about it, you know, the market, you have to think about who would want to read it. And I actually, when I was writing The University of Doom, what was going on in my head is like, this is the kind of book I would have loved to have read when I was 13 years old. So that was sort of what was kind of guided that. Um, as far as writing it, you know, the difference between writing for a young adult and writing for an adult market, you know, it's really hard for me to give you any rules and about the only rule i could say is the protagonist has to be a certain age um and even then you'll find um that that's not always true so in in the effect for example university of doom alfonso is 12 years old uh i think 12 13 so that makes it actually what they call a middle grade book right because a young adult is a little bit older than that uh, the other thing is is that you as as you're writing that particular book then you have to be aware of what the issues are going on right for example, your protagonist has to be reacting to the world as if they're in that particular age, right? So you couldn't have a 13-year-old react to the world like an adult would because, you know, that, that, that and you wouldn't, you know, you'd lose the audience, you know. And uh, same thing, you know, somebody who's a teenager looks at the world a certain way. So you have to kind of explore what's going on through their head and, you know, and, and look back at those painful memories when you were growing up. Uh, you know, adolescence and teenage years and kind of mind that. Um, a lot of it is, you know, in those particular years, you're trying to find your place in the world. Uh, you're trying to understand the way the world works around you. Um, sometimes with your authority figures, your adults, you kind of see that they're flawed and you're going to have to, uh, you know, work within that, that framework. Um, and also, you know, you're trying to think, you know, what, what does life hold for me? Where am I going with my life? Uh, that's very important for, for young people. So, so those are the kind of things you work into it. Uh, as far as University of Doom, um, I love conspiracy theories. You know, I love the idea of mad science. And so I really wanted to put that into the book. Uh, and, you know, things like Frankenstein and, and these weird inventions. And, and as if you read the book, you'll see all kinds of things from pop, popular culture come in, like robots, but the old style robots, you know, with very boxy bodies and the, and the wiry arms. I even have Martian war machines in the book because I love the War of the Worlds. Um, the idea of uh, reanimating all kinds of weird creatures and monsters and stuff. So I, so I, th that's, that's something that I wanted to do and have this in the book. Um, but the other thing is, when you're writing a book, any book, it's really about the characters and how they react to one another. So I had a lot of fun with this book. There's the girl, Sarah Baker. Uh, and I had a lot of fun writing her because she's very different from Alfonso. But yet, she's very smart. She's got a lot of street smarts. And every time the two have, a, have an exchange, she always has the last word. And it's not that she's 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 trying to... She's arrogant about herself. It's just that she sees the world differently. And sometimes she sees the world with a lot more clarity than Alfonso does, even though Alfonso regards himself as a super genius. So that, that had a lot of fun with that part. Yeah, I love it. And I really want to comment on this because I was a middle school, high school librarian, and there aren't enough good books for boys, you know, 12 and 13 year old boys. And I guess this isn't more of a tween book. So there's a real need. Um, for, for books uh, for boys this age. And my, my grandson is, is 13 and he used to be a wonderful reader. Now we're having a hard time with him. So I had him read the first three pages and he actually went on to the fourth, 
to the fourth page and he says, yeah, I would be interested. So I'm going to, I'm going to get him his own, own copy, okay, but I sure. want to, do you mind reading the first three paragraphs? Oh, sure. To get us hooked here. All right. Hopefully that goes. Um, first three paragraphs. Okay. The chapter one, a dead badger lay on Alfonso Frankenstein's lab table, but the badger wouldn't stay dead for long. Besides the standard electrodes attached to the creature's neck, Alfonso planned to juice the experiment by sliding a third electrode up the badger's butt. So, so it's very I, much for boys. I know that that I think he that's why he loved it. <laughs> he just I could just see him, and I thought usually I have him close after the first paragraph, but no, he 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 went to the fourth page. So, so thank you. Will there be a sequel to this one? Do you know yet? I have a sequel in mind. I have a, I have a lot of books kind of in my head in my queue. Um, and as I wrote the, as I wrote the book, I actually left some things, some threads open as to, um, characters and plot lines that I could weave into the university of doom. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you still, um, going to write adult books and will there be another Felix uh, Gomez mystery vampire mystery? Well, I have, yeah. I, well, I actually have more, more books that I want to write adult stories. I, I, I want to write a, I love crime novels. I love gangster movies. So I definitely want to write something like that. And that's actually what I started to write way back. Um, so there's that. There's a couple of supernatural stories that I'd like to flesh out. Uh, as far as for, as far as to Felix, you know, the thing is, I don't, I don't really, I haven't really thought of an idea for another story to really hook me in. Um, he, I, I don't know if, if you follow the series, the last book, he got switched. And he's in an alternate universe with all kinds of new characters and, and things. And he's very well placed there. And I, I'm very happy with the way that that particular book ended. But I did leave it open ended where it could walk into a sequel. I just I just really don't haven't thought of what what that would be. And, you know, once I start writing the book, I'm kind of in it for the next, you know, nine months to a year. So, you know, it's kind of like, OK, I don't want to go down that path because I'm going to be on that path for for a long time here until it gets done. So that's, you know, yeah. So the answer is yes, I have more stories. So does it take about a year to write the, how long does it take you to write each, like each book or, or are they different? Well, right now it's taken me about a year. I, I've sort of, uh, I guess through practice and that I've, I've gotten a little bit better as, as to how do I structure the story and how do I apply my time? Um, when I first started writing, I was what they call a pantser which is mean seat of the pants and you just like start writing and see where you go. Um, and now I'm more of an outliner. I, I sit down and I write a uh, chapter outline. It's about six to 10 pages and to kind of give me a framework of which way the story is going and how the characters react to one another. But then as I write the story, uh, I'm always surprised that what happens. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you the one that always surprised me are the female characters because I have the female characters and I start putting them in the story and I have to really work to keep them from taking over, <laughs> taking over the story. I have to rein them back in. Uh, so that's always a lot of fun. That is very interesting. <laughs> very yeah. interesting. Well, you know, it, it has to do people, you know, you ever hear that about writers saying that their characters talk to them and, uh, and the characters take a life of their own. Well, that, you know, that that's true. Um, but it's true in the sense that, I guess to be a good writer, you have to be somewhat of a psychologist and you have to understand how people uh, work and how they react to one another. And then you put people in these certain situations and to make them credible, they have to act a certain way and then they have to act on, on their own agenda. And this is what happens is, is that if I'm going to put this particular character doing this, they have to be doing that for a specific reason. And, and then you have to follow through in that reason. And that's how the characters grow and kind of take over the story if you're not careful. Yeah, it's really interesting that you said that because I've known a lot of authors that have told me that they sometimes hear the characters that they're developing whisper in their ears. And, you know, and, and I think that that's really, really interesting. Um, you collaborated with author, authors such as Richard Kilborn and Good Money Gone um, and Kirk Raber in Forgotten Letters. What do you think of the collaboration process with other authors? Well, that's obvious. Well, okay, well, the way that that process works it was actually like a, a work for hire meaning um both of them had tried to, to write uh, a, a novel they had an idea for a story 
And you know, it's 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 a hard thing to do, and it takes you a while to learn. It took me 17 years from the time I started to write a, a book, and and in the hopes of getting it published, to the to to actually getting it published. Uh, most people it takes between five to ten. So I'm a I'm not a very good you know I, I'm a hard headed student I guess. So it took me 17 years, but I got it done. And so what happens is people have this story in mind and they can either do one of two things. Either they can take the time to learn how to uh, read or, or write the story or they can hire somebody else. And they hired me. And uh, actually there's there's other books that I've worked as a work for hire. But what happened in these two that the when I got done with the story or close to being done with the story, the 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 other uh person, the co-author, or I'm the co-author, the actual author, would approach me and said, you know, I really like this story so much. I want your name on the cover. We, I want to share credit with you on the cover. So that's how that works. Um, so, but it's a collaborative process. Some people come into a story, into this process in a very, very vague concept. They want a story about something and you ask them, oh, well, okay, who's the character? What is their name? And they're like, I don't know their name. What do they want? Well, I'm not really sure. What do they want them to do? Well, I want them to do this and this. And you ask, well, why, why are they doing that? Well, I don't know. And other people have a very structured uh, idea about the story. Um, for example, in Forgotten Letters, um, let's cover for it, uh, Rick Raybar actually uh, dreamt about the book, uh, dreamt the, the opening scene of the story, and it just stayed in his head for years and years and he goes i got to do something with it so then he got with me and we started working on that and it, and it, it, it turned out that that original dream that he had wasn't really working for the kind of story that he had so we had to kind of change that a little bit but um you know i would write i would have a uh, create an outline so he understood what what the story was going to be and then i would send him chapters and then he would um, reflect on the chapter and give him give me his edits and that because it's ultimately his story uh, and so we, we you know so that's how that collaboration process works I have collaborated with other writers on for example screenplays and what we did is we, we wrote an outline and then we we assigned each other um, parts of that outline to work on it independently and then we wrote those parts of the screenplay and then they, we, we would put them back together and I was astonished how well they actually came together. It's almost seamless. And it was just maybe just the fact that I just got teamed up with somebody who was in sync with the way I thought. So I was pretty surprised with, uh, with those other processes. Uh, I, I think the, the big thing is that when you collaborate with somebody, they have to be as invested in the, pro in the process as you are. Uh, I think if... Um, if you were to write something and the other person uh, doesn't want to put in the, the, the work um, or doesn't want to come through with, you know, their side of the, of the deal, it's, it's not going to go, um, it's not going to go anywhere. And you need to identify that up front because, you know, it's going to take you months to a year to write uh, a book. So you're going to be working with this person for a long time. So it's best to get all the, all the kinks and all the, the rough spots out of the way first before you get into the, into the process. Thank you. That's really good. What advice do you have for inspiring the writers to stay on track and one day be published? You know, have faith in what you're doing. Uh, believe in yourself. Um, and, you know, the way to do it maybe would be get involved. I mean, what really worked for me, it would be in a writer's group um, and, and to choose people that are similar to you in, in terms of aspirations. Um, you know, I wouldn't advise getting in on a writer's book with everybody's already published multiple times and that because they're further along in the process than you are. And, and you know, they, they might resent you having, having to shepherd you along. And at the same time, you don't want to get involved with anybody who's really not serious about what they're writing. Or if you're writing a certain kind of a story, a genre, and some and they're writing something else that's, that's not really jiving, then... Um, uh, what will happen is that you might, your group might try to force them to write their kind of story rather than your kind of story. Uh, I guess a good example is that in our group, we mainly write um, 
science fiction or crime. There's always a crime element of our, in our stories. So we always like that. So somebody came into our group and they wanted to write um, romance stories. And we would tell them, you know, the story would work a lot better if this person killed that person, right? And, and so that's the way we think. And they're like, no, that can't work because this is the brother to the romance story. And we're like, well, that's better. That's awesome. They're like, no, no, no. Uh, so, so you have to be careful about, uh, you know, what kind of advice you're getting because ultimately you're, you're writing your own book. You don't want anybody else to write your book for you. Um, so, you know, it's a process and you just have to believe in yourself um, and, and, and stick with it. Get involved in a critique group or a writer's group that's supportive but at the same time, gives you the kind of uh, criticism that you need. Um, set some goals that you can set is a reading, you know, uh, go to a reading where you get on stage and you read a chapter from one of your books and just kind of get used to having feedback with people. Um, another thing good about a critique group is that you get to look at their work as well as they look get to look at yours. And people tell you, you know, you got to work on emotion in your story. You got to work on dialogue or whatever. And you're like, well, I kind of, I kind of think I understand that. Why are they saying the same things? And then you read it in somebody else's work, and you're like, ah, oh, ah, now I see the problem. You see the problem in somebody else's work, and then you realize what you're doing wrong. So that's it's it's very instructive that way. Yeah. But like I said, <laughs> just have faith in yourself and keep at it. That's excellent advice. And so I'm going to have a surprise question for you as a last question. We are having your sister. Sylvia, next week, what okay. question do you think we should ask her? <laughs> <laughs> well, is- I could be, you know, I could, uh, uh, we, we, she and I think very differently. Um, I, 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 you could ask her, is it true that you're, that, that Mario is your older brother is smarter than you? <laughs> <laughs> and I tell her, tell her, this is the question that Mario asked. Is it truly smarter than you? And okay. uh, you know, and I think she will. She will have fun with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, she Maria. Say, yeah, Maria Smyer is here, so she will. She's written that down, and that's a question we'll ask her. Okay. Yeah, so I. Yeah. My sister will answer. Oh, he's smarter than me. That's why he's always asking me for money, huh? <laughs> so I love your bow tie, by the way. So uh, we're going to have a, a question, which might um, give you a. a a prize out there. So uh, can anybody answer if Mario uh, is uh, doing a sequel of the Felix Gomez stories? We're supposed to have somebody, some people out there, but they're not. They're too shy. Chat they're, too, they're too shy. They're too shy. Well, you know, part of it is if they're, if they're on Facebook, if you're following this on Facebook, you have to be on Facebook to look at their questions. Yeah. And we're on this we're on this Streamyard that uh, I this is my first time on Streamyard, so um, I don't I don't know maybe. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. Are there any questions from our audience? Because we were going to have a few people that we're going to uh, be wanting to ask you some questions, but we're not uh, not uh, getting any. Um, so um, I'm going to end it there, and we're right on time. Wow, how can how can that have happened? But um, do you have any uh, closing comments, Mario? Uh, closing comments? Well, um, just thank you very much for this opportunity to um, uh, to be here. Um, I, I'm I there's there's more Latino Latina writers that that uh, I am being exposed or reading their work to, and I'll I'll forward your names maybe for for next year. You can invite them. Um, yes, love that. You know, one of the advantages now we were talking about the advantages, disadvantages of this this online uh, conferencing. I mean, you know, one of the disadvantages is that you don't get to see people, you know, the way we want to. But the other thing is, it certainly makes it easier for you to bring people from outside without having all the expenses and stuff. So, uh, and some of those um, writers are from, uh, you know, other other areas of the country. So hopefully, you'll be able to to invite them and have them here. Well, some people like virtual, some people like, uh, you know, real, the real thing. So maybe we'll do a, a hybrid because right. I, I think we need people. We talked about that earlier. So we really do need people. Uh, so. Let me think here. Um, you know, the thing is, is that 
um, I guess this is kind of a technical one. I'm on, I'm on Facebook and this is not showing up on Facebook, the live stream, unless I got it wrong. I just can't find it. So, um, okay. Uh, oh, it is. It is. It is. It is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll have you, uh, and and this will be recorded too. So we're really excited about that. So, so Mario, thank you so much, and, um, oh, no, and we want you back sometime. And I'm definitely going to take your advice about getting a hold of Lighthouse and see if we can get some get them out here to give us because we have so many aspiring writers here in Pueblo, and we just need a right. little right. little nudge and a little advice. So, so thank you, and uh, we'll Absolutely. see you next time. Okay. Okay, you take care now. Yes. Bye-bye. All right. Is it out? Are we out?